Uh, I came here from the European Parliament yesterday, and as I was leaving the Parliament building, I was mugged. I was held up by somebody with a knife who said, give me your money. <laughs> and I, well, I thought I'd try and bluff it out, so I drew myself up and I said, you are making a terrible mistake. I am a member of the European Parliament. He said, all right, then give me my money. <laughs> We've got, um, we've got Euro elections coming up with the county elections on the 4th of June. I think I can now reveal to you exclusively the secret of how I got elected. I was in the count last year, their last election, and I remember seeing these ballot papers piling up and everyone had been scrawling next to my name, shove off back to Brussels. <laughs> Actually using a rather stronger word than shove. <laughs> and I thought, that's it. You know, it's all over. I can't win from here. But I'd reckoned without the ingenuity of my agent who went over to the returning officer with a great kind of armful of these ballot papers, and he said, look, uh, it's plainly the intention of all these electors to return Daniel Hannan to Brussels. <laughs> uh, and therefore, all of these should be counted as votes in the conservative interest, uh, and thus it is that I come to be standing before you here tonight uh, up for re-election. Really nice to see so many uh, people from the Freedom Association, fellow members. Really nice as well to see so many CF people, because you boys and girls are going to be the people who are paying for what the government is doing now. For the whole, I don't want to depress you here, you know, but those of you who haven't got a drink, pour yourselves one now. You are going to be paying the whole of your working lives to undo what is going to happen in the next two years. Gordon Brown is going to borrow more this year and next than was borrowed in the whole history of the national debt from 1692 Sorry. to Can the I present day. Sorry. To find a time when we were borrowing so fast and at such a high uh, percentage of our national wealth, you have to go back to VE Day. And that debt, that debt that we faced after 1945, was the central fact of what followed. It explained why Britain, having apparently emerged from the Second World War unscathed, without its infrastructure as badly damaged as the countries that had been fought over on land, didn't grow at the rate that they did. In the 50s and 60s, British commentators used to scratch their heads and say, why is it that the Germans and the Italians and these countries who've suffered so much more, how is it that they've outperformed us? And of course, what they weren't seeing was that those countries were starting with a clean slate, whereas we had an accumulated debt of 350% of our GDP. So it was as though you could imagine looking at two neighboring houses, one of them dilapidated, pockmarked, but owned outright. The other one apparently sturdy, but with a mortgage equivalent to 350% of its value. Which one, 20 years later, is going to be in a better condition? The one that was in negative equity or the one that was owned outright? That's the situation that we are returning to. I'm not telling you this just to depress you. The reason I'm telling you this is because I think it's important, when we're talking among ourselves as friends, as conservatives, it's important to understand the magnitude of the task that will be faced by an incoming Conservative administration. This level of debt, this level of public spending, this level of borrowing, is not going to be something that we can address with a little bit of nip and tuck, with a pay restraint order here and a freeze there. We need to tackle the structural causes of high spending and high borrowing in this country. And those structural causes are very easily stated. The reason that budgets in Britain continue to grow so fast is because they are set by members of the executive who are therefore beneficiaries of higher spending, rather than by members of the legislature who are therefore champions of the taxpayer. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Across most of Europe and in the United States, there were bailout and stimulus packages, but they were agreed by the national parliaments. Barack Obama's growth package was haggled over to every last dollar and cent by the House and by the Congress. In other words, it was voted on by people who knew that a year or two later, they were going to have to go back to the people who were going to pay for the whole thing and explain why they voted as they did. Contrast that to what happened in our country, where Gordon Brown decreed a stimulus package much larger in per capita terms than that which Barack Obama did, without even summoning Parliament. Not only was there no vote, 
There wasn't even a debate. My friends, we came through a civil war in this country to establish the principle that only the House of Commons might raise revenue through legitimate taxation. And now we've allowed the executive to engorge its powers in a way that the Stuart Kings didn't dream of. Parliament is becoming decorative, folkloric almost. I, I don't know if you saw uh, the day that they decreed the Heathrow expansion. And the Labour uh, MP who represents Heathrow was reduced to grabbing the mason, throwing it in the place where he normally sits, because that was the only protest he could make, having not been able to raise his voice on behalf of his constituents in what was once the Supreme Council of the Nation. What's the point of having elections when we are run by a standing quangocracy, when the ballot box has been drained of power, and when how we vote no longer changes things because the country is now run by and for its bureaucracy? And that is what an incoming government has to tackle. As long as we have this huge apparatus, the little minister will be encased inside a machine that he doesn't control. He'll be jabbing away at buttons that have long since been disconnected, pulling at levers that have worked loose. Because it's rather like, it's rather like uh, in Asimov's books where the robots learn to program each other without any human intervention. The quangos beget other quangos. The agencies beget new advisory panels at every stage growing further away from the elected man or woman who is meant to run the whole thing. And that is what we have to tackle. There are two ways of doing it. First of all, we have to put elected people back in charge. And that means that every agency, every quango, every uh, executive body, every department should have to come before the relevant House of Commons Committee on an annual basis to plead for its continued funding and indeed for its continued existence. Second, we should push the money downwards and outwards to a more local level where it can be more accountably wielded. It's ridiculous that we have the most centralized system of government in Europe in this country. Only 25% of the money spent by local councils is raised locally. The rest all comes from the Treasury. And so you have this perverse incentive to spend more and more, because if you are an efficient, prudent council, you get punished with a lower grant. Whereas if you are a hopeless, uh, profligate, incontinent, a wasteful and wasteful <laughs> council, then you create so much uh, social damage with your policies that you start attracting more and more money from the centre, which means that more of your voters become dependent on it, which means that they're likelier to vote for the party which created the problem. And so we need to have a proper link between taxation and representation and expenditure at local level so that councillors are properly held to account for their actions, or better yet, to push powers one stage down from the local council and give it to the individual citizen. That's the context in which we are now going in to these combined local and European elections. We are fighting against the Lisbon Treaty, against the centralization of power in Europe, not because we are atavistic or stubborn or jingoistic, not because we distrust foreigners, not because we're against the idea of a European Union that arbitrates disputes among its member states and encourages collaboration. You'd have to be insane to be against that. Our problem with it is that it has become remote and self-serving and undemocratic and cut off from the people that it is meant to, to represent. But here's the point, my friends. We have that problem in this country too. There's no point in bringing powers back from Brussels only to leave them festering in Whitehall. There's no point in replacing rule by an unelected European Commission with rule by unelected quangos in this country. We see the repatriation of jurisdiction from Brussels not as an end in itself, but as a beginning. <clears throat> a beginning of a process that will restore honour to the ballot box, dignity to the legislature, and freedom to the citizen. That's the message that we'll have between now and the 4th of June. Now, one very uh, good bit of news is that all of this can be done, in theory, in just one legislative session, in just 12 months, with 30 legal acts by a new government. And I have brought along my share chance at a very reasonable price, <laughs> a plan showing how it can be done. And this explains how you could break the, the state monopoly in education and have lots of local referendums and have elected sheriffs running the police and all the rest of it. In a way.